do a little bit on each side until you get one line. Putting these together is pretty easy when you only got the one pin out. All you gotta do is rock the lock lever out of the way. Come right off. And that, uh, and that's your finished product. Beautiful. These are all dumb punches that were used at the factory in the dies to punch holes. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I make tools out of them, and you know everybody at the cutlery would make tools out of them. A uh, tool like that I use for bumping springs on the back of a knife to um, make it stronger. Um, a lot of these are used for pushing pins out. Um, sometimes I, I'll flatten a pin if I need to with, with uh, one of these pieces. But I have, I have uh, over the years, just came up with little tools that I need to take knives apart and put them back together. This is a, a little lock back with a tortoise shell handle. It's a celluloid tortoise shell. It looks like to me somebody tried to finish off a riveted pin without knocking the pin off first because they kind of dragged it out and popped the pin. Yep. And um, this blade is bad because it's been ground off um, on the grinder. When they put it on the uh, in the fixture, they didn't put it all back up against the pin and um, so it was ground off. So that blade's no good, so we're going we're gonna to cut it out. Sometimes you can push a pin out. These are flared pretty good. I don't think I'm going to be able to push them out. I mean, it's possible, and, that's, and that is what I use um, some of these tools for, is to push, push a pin out. But that, one, that one's not going to move, so we're not even going to try it, because the more you push and bend something, the harder it is to get it out. Um, maybe a blade this size that isn't really sharp, but it's got a fairly mm -hmm. tight edge on it. Okay, you drive it in along the edge of the blade there. And cut the pin. Sometimes when you cut the pin, you can just twist the blade off like that, and it'll come out. Mm -hmm. All right, so yep. that's out. So all I did was put that pin up against this part of the steady mm -hmm. so that it's starting to pop out there. Um, the best way to do this sometimes, I mean sometimes you can get a hold of that and, you know, and pull it out from there, mm -hmm. but once you've got the flared part sticking out, you can cut that off. Okay. And then you can use this cut out here on the part of the steady. Mm -hmm. And take a small bevel headed punch. And you can drive that pin out. Okay, so now we've got the pin out of that side. We want to be able to get down into this side of the Grab a hold of that. So I've done the same thing. I've raised the pin on that side and we're just going to cut it off. So, now the pin's out. Another um, piece of equipment that everybody should have is a set of dial, dial calipers. Um, I know because I work on this pattern a lot that that's a 14 gauge piece of wire. Um, this, this brass wire right here is not 14 gauge, it's um, 13 gauge. That's 093094 is 13 gauge. So 14 gauge would be like 083, 082. Um, so that's that's the gauge wire that I need, plus it's nickel silver and that's what I want to put back in here. So I have a good blade, this is out of a, actually out of a Santa Fe, it's the right blade though. Putting these together is pretty easy when you only got the one pin out because all you got to do is rock the lock lever out of the way. 
slide the new blade in. going to have a high point. It's no problem. Once we get it all put together, we just grind the kick a little bit here and drop the point inside the knife where it belongs. Another thing that you learn after a while is you really should have a blade that's a little thicker than the lock lever when you're riveting stuff up. Um, this is going to be real close. I'm not too concerned about it, but the blade should be uh, three to five thousandths thicker than either your back spring or your um, lock lever. And the reason for that is, is when you rivet it up, if your lock lever was thicker, in order to tighten the blade, you're going to be pinching your uh, lock lever. Okay. But if your blade is thicker, it's you rivet it up, up and, 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 and even if the blade is tight when you get done, you can rock it a little bit and loosen it just enough to make it work. Okay. Um, but if you rock it enough to make your lock lever work, your blade will probably be loose. Be loose. So that's, that's the rule of thumb on any um, pocket knife assembly. And uh, sometimes we didn't have that luxury at the cutler. They would buy nominal stock and 14 gauge, and it might come in, you know, three or four thousandths either way, lower or higher. Right. And so, um, you know, they had to work with that. Sometimes they, uh, they actually had some little Teflon washers they made to put on either side of the blade at, and some knives just so that they would take up the difference. Yep. Because a lock lever uh, is not made out of the same steel as the blade. So um, this would be a lower grade stainless. It would still be hardenable, like 410 or uh, low carbon 420, but your blades would be made out of uh, 420 high carbon or um, 440A stainless. Okay. So this was cheaper, didn't need to do a good, better cutlery steel, so you didn't always get the, the same thicknesses that you wanted. So when you go to rivet something like this up, um, another essential tool is a slacker. This is nothing more than a piece of steel shim stock. This particular piece is um, about 15, 14, 15 thousand shim stock, which works perfect for me when I'm, when I'm riveting something up. Because basically when I rivet it up, I know it's going to be loose. I pull the shim stock out and just tap the, the head of the pin a couple of times to tighten it up where I want it, and I know it's good. Um, the other thing is um, the hole in the bolster um, it's probably about 086, which is, you know, maybe three or four thousandths thicker than your pin. Um, but at the surface, there's a counter bore, mm -hmm. and the counter bore is always about ten thousandths over that. So the counter bore in this is probably about 093 to 096, and that goes in there maybe uh, 50 thousandths, 60 thousandths deep. So when you flare this pin out, you're flaring it out into that counter bore, and that's what holds the knife together. Another thing that, um, you know, you learn as you go is how long to leave the uh, the pin for riveting or spinning or whatever you're going to do. Um, I do this by eye. If you, if you look at how much pin I've got sticking out there, yeah. I feel that that's not a bad amount. If you go too high, you're pounding, pounding, pounding in order to flare it out against the bolster. Mm -hmm. um, so let's measure this. I'm I'm going to say I'm probably out there close to a hundred thousands because that's about. Um, something that, actually it's not a hundred thousand, it's about sixty thousands. About sixty-five there. So, you know, looking at that, that's sixty thousands almost looks perfect to me. If you were doing a, a knife that took like a an eighth inch pin, mm -hmm. you'd want to be out there further, maybe closer to a hundred thousand. So depending the on the pin, the more yeah. you want to leave out to flare. Yeah, and also too, if you've got a damaged bolster where that counter bore is stretched out from being riveted on and stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to need a little more pin in order to fill that counter bore. So, you know, it's all relative, but a good rule of thumb on a knife with a 14 or um, a 13 gauge pin, 60, 70 thousandths per side isn't bad. Um, that actually works pretty good. Now you got your slacker in there, it doesn't usually matter which side the slacker's on, but you keep it to the front of the knife. And you go back and forth, you don't do just you're riveting on one side because you'll slide the pin and when you go to flip it over you're going to find out you got anything to rivet on this side. But generally you do a little bit on each side until you get what you want. If these were brass bolsters I'd be using a brass pin. Sometimes even on the brass knives or the nickel silver knives, we use the steel pin. Um, gives you a lot stronger um, torque point, 
um, you know, certain knives they wanted to put a steel pin in because it was something maybe a oh had a saw blade, a small saw blade, or a screwdriver, or a tool like that. You'll see a lot of the um, uh, electrician's knives had steel pins um, just because of the strength. It's probably a lot harder to pin those in, isn't it? It is, um, but to use a you know a really a well annealed um, stainless steel pin. I'll tell you, some of the hardest pins to rivet are your brass because they harden over time. Oh. So a lot of times I'll take my brass and I've got a little spoon at home and I'll take my little torch and I'll just heat them up till they start to, to get just a little bit red. Okay. And let them cool off, it totally anneals them. Hmm. I mean, you can anneal them so you can almost bend them by hand. Um, right. But for, that's the problem with brass and if you got soft bolsters and you try and put a hard pin in a, uh, a soft bolster, uh, you'd very have a very hard time getting a good mesh between the pin and the uh, bolster. Yep. You go to move it a little bit and it breaks loose, where if they're both pretty close to the same hardness, they really forge together well. And then when you finish them off, you, you really don't see any pin at all. Even if you did see some pin, but at what you couldn't see anywhere where it was broke loose from the bolster, sometimes the materials aren't exactly the same. You know, nickel silver is made up of a couple different metals and sometimes the uh, chemistry is a little different so when you polish it you might be able to see that pin because it's just slightly more silver or slightly more dull um, but generally the, the pin material is pretty close to the bolster and you finish it off and you can't even tell there's a pin there um, you know I, I think these pins are pretty close so when you finish it off You can go as far as you want. If you go go too far, it'll be really tight when you pull your slacker out, and then you will have to rock it, and that always takes a chance of breaking your. Basically, you just want to make sure you fill that counter bore. I mean, I got a pretty good head on both sides, so um, by the time you pull your, now that's that's pretty tight. Um, with this here, it's just, it's just a little tight, so what I'll do is just rock it a little bit with a plastic hammer. Hit that side, hit that side. Now it's perfect. So I barely moved it, okay? Um, the joints on this look pretty good. Uh, if this was higher, it would mean that um, the end grind was a little bit off here and wasn't dropping into the notch. So we had an operation down there. It was done right on an arbor press like this. You put a pin in here. Um, similar to this and then another pin like that and you, you put this on here and you push the uh, lock lever down into the notch mm -hmm. usually further than you needed to okay and then you would just you know, tap it a couple times and uh, it would break it loose and you know the guy would check it again and make sure that you know the lock lever was where it was supposed to be that operation was done after you half the back you know you have to closed and so when you opened it, everything was, of course, you know, even at that point. When you opened it, you could tell if you had a high joint. Right. And then they would do the blacksmithing. Generally, they tried to get away from doing blacksmithing. Everything was checked on uh, comparators when they did the end grinds. We had gauges set up, so every couple of pieces, they'd slide it into a gauge, check it. You know, and if you got it pretty close, you usually didn't have any problem with that. But um, sometimes you did. So, okay, it's got a high point, which means... Um, this kick area needs to be ground. At the cutlery, we would have strung these all up and put them in a surface grinder in a fixture and um, ground that tang off. But um, a lot of times, the repair guys, they had a high high point. It's just a matter of hitting that kick a little bit, checking it about halfway there. If you were doing four, you know, four or five hundred of these, you'd almost know how much to take off the first time. If you did about 30 of them, we're just about inside the knife now. It's better to keep checking it and get it where you want it than to go too far and then you got a blade that's going to be striking on your spring or something on the inside. And that, that'll, you know, take a little chunk out of your edge or whatever. So now we've got the point pretty much where we want it. A lot of the shields in Delrin were uh, melted and we had uh, fixed strings set up and little heat shielders and they would just drop the shield into the cavity and a little pressure and a little time and a little heat, it would melt it right where you wanted it and that's how most of your shields are held in in Delrin. But in celluloid or bone or um, 
buffalo horn or something like that stag, um, it has, they have to be bonded in. Years ago, when they put them in, they riveted them in. This would have a little hole here and here, yep. and a very small little piece of wire would be used, and the guy would rivet that shield in and then finish the pin off. So I stay in the back just so I get a better bond. Uh, nickel silver doesn't bond all that great, but if you do stay in the back, you know it's nice and clean, and you've got some serrations back there to hold the groove. Not a bad idea to, to score up the, the inside of the cavity. And always check to make sure before you put your glue in that your shield is going to fit. I've already fitted this so I know it's going to go in there. Um, have yourself a rag ready to wipe off the excess. You don't need much. Just a little drop in there will do it. Um, the celluloid bonds really well, so. Generally, I'll throw a clamp on there just for a minute or so. Little spring clamps that we used to use for all the, uh, the woodcraft knives. We had a couple of thousand of these clamps. You can see the glue residue that's still on them when we were <laughs> at one point we were bonding all the uh, woodcraft knives um, and then when actually they rivet them at first then they bonded them for a few years and it was a terrible mistake and so then they went back to riveting again <laughs> so. this is a, uh, a 60 grip belt 2 by 72 grizzly belt sander it's actually called a knife machine that's what they call it it uh, Generally comes with an 8-inch contact wheel, um, but I um, made a hub so that I could put the 6-inch on there. My better machine at home, I can switch out any any uh, wheels I want, but these machines aren't made that way. So the reason I changed that to a 6-inch, and this is a good example, um, an 8-inch wheel will not fit in that radius. Okay, mm -hmm. and I do a lot of knives that I need to do inside finish on. And if I don't have a six inch wheel on, I can't get in there and do that. Just sure your belt is cracking good. You know, you don't want it coming off and hitting you in the finger or the side of this belt and cut you just like a knife. Pretty easy to tell the difference between the 60 grit and the, uh, the 120. You can see I haven't taken out the deep scratches here and here. But you can see I'm starting to smooth that out real nice. And you don't want to press hard, you want to keep your shape, you don't want to change the shape of the knife. You said you were hafting, and I don't think everybody knows what hafting is. And that was um, the rough half and the fine half that we did to match up all the parts all the way around on the knife. And uh, celluloid will will burn and melt, so you want to make sure you keep the belt grease on there, and, and don't don't really try and um, take more material off all at once. Give it a, give the belt a chance to cut. Something else to take some some technique and learning is to make sure you're squaring everything up. You wouldn't want that to be off on an angle. That would mean you're grinding more off of one side than the other. It all takes practice. I used to have to train guys at the cutlery how to do halfing, and it would take some some guys could, could pick it up in 15 minutes. Some guys could never pick it up, <laughs> and that's the truth. My son Cal was real good uh, at picking stuff up like this. Um, not because he's my son, but because he, you know, some guys just have the ability to, you know, the hand and eye control to be able to see that. But I, I show that to some people over there and give them 10 minutes or 15 minutes to work on a couple of knives and come back and they still wouldn't have it. And I do that all day long with them and I finally say, I don't think you're going to get this, you know. <laughs> okay, we've uh, got a little bit more right there. Pretty much got everything cleaned up all the way around. There will be one more operation with a scotch sprite belt after we get some other work done. Um, the only other thing we're going to do right now 
And this knife has already been flat sanded here, so all these pins are knocked down pretty good, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, probably wouldn't, if I had my drum sander here, I would. I would do a little bit more on that. I mean, I probably could just hit this cover a little bit. take out the deeper scratches. I can't really do that on this side, um, but I think it's good enough because it, I've taken off the top of my shield. And, you know. But we are gonna we are gonna knock that pin off and uh, radius the bolster. Okay. So that would actually be called um, bader blending at the cutler because we use the bader machine. Blended all the parts at the bolster, all the handle material, took the pin off and uh, it did radius the bolster. Alright, so um, basically my, I have my scratches going in this direction from that machine, so I'm going to go in this direction to round this up and take all them scratches off. Uh, if you're going in this direction, sometimes it's tough to tell if you've got all your scratches out. But if you, if you change directions, then you look at it and you can say, oh, I've still got some scratches going this way, so... Isn't a, a wheel that wide a bigger advantage to a small wheel? Well, they've got more surface here, so you can, you can do a lot more knives on a surface that wide before you've got to put more greaseless on the wheel. Um, generally, because the greaseless is wet when you put it on, like I got to go get it out of the refrigerator, and I keep it. You keep it cold in the refrigerator. If it was out here, it's like a glue stick actually with a brace of them, and they make all different grits. I use 120 for this operation, but if I'm, uh, you know, I have a finer grit. I have a 600 grit. I mean, it goes all the way up. You can get it down to like 60 grit, all the way up to six or 800. So it's not so much an advantage of being able to do a better job. You just have more surface to work with before you have to reapply or something like that. Now, if I had to use my, my drum sander, that would have taken me about two passes on each side to take them scratched out. But I, because, you know, going against a hard wheel over there, you're kind of cutting in a little bit and not leaving a flat surface. So I've got to take more material off here to compensate for that. But on my drum sander, I could lay it right up in there and everything would be nice and flat and uh, it would be a little finer. Grid. I use like a 180 on my, uh, on my uh, drum sander. So, um, those are a little warm, but that's that's what the finish looks like on the bolsters after the uh, after the greaseless operation. I'm still going to hit the uh, celluloid a little bit, and try and take out some of the scratches on the celluloid here. But you got to do that with uh, you got to do that with a little bit of care because you don't want to uh, you don't want to burn it. But you can round up your edges a little bit here. Um, a lot of times when you're finishing off a knife like this, it's good just to break these edges. Um, you know, it's a little easier to hold on to, you know, you're not holding right onto a sharp corner. You'll see that I'm taking all the sanding scratches out of the uh, out of the celluloid. And that's it for this operation. Actually, this is a good time to uh, you know re-greaseless your wheel, although we took very little off. Now some of these hubs are made thicker or thinner, so sometimes you're kind of confined to the size of your hub. 
you know, I've got some other hubs at home, but not all hubs will go on all these tapered shafts. Some of these tapered shafts have been turned down and cleaned up, and so the, you know, the, some of the hubs slide too far on. So you kind of, kind of fit them. I had to fit these to this particular machine as opposed to the one I have at home. Okay. What is that stuff you're putting on there? The scour is a mixture of a soap, it looks a lot like grease, it's called Folkite, and um, uh, double lot pumice, ground pumice. steel parts, you know, you want to dry everything off afterwards um, because it is water soluble. Um, I don't know much why I've never put water in this, but I think the, uh, the soap itself has some, some bit of moisture in it. Um, I mean, you can take this up to the sink and just wash it right off your hand. It just breaks right down. It's not, it's really not a grease or anything. All right, next um, step for finishing would be buffing, but first we're going to do a scotch right on the back and edges, we're going to scotch bright the blade quick and we're going to sharpen and then the last operation will be buff. So that's what you have right now. So this is a scotch bright belt? Yep, 3M makes them, other people make them. Um, they're what they call a woven finishing belt. They come in different grips. This is the uh, extra fine, it's blue. No matter who makes it, it's always blue. I like buying 3M, they're the best. They hold up well, they last longer. Um, this one is for a fine finish. I use the red ones also. Um, those are good for scotch brighting blades. They're a little more coarse. When you first get them, they're real coarse, but they can tend to break down a little bit. And that's pretty much your final finish. Now, there is some dings in the back of this blade. The uh, yeah, 5A medium would have um, would take them right out a lot easier than this belt, but it does cut. I mean, it is abrasive. You can see I've kind of smoothed out those scratches a bit. But, uh, this is a hollow ground blade, so I can lay it up against this wheel right in the hollow and scotch it. I'm going to try and take that Santa Fe Stoneworks uh, that's off. Got most of it off. Alright, we're going to sharpen and strop. It's basically the same machine as that, only I've rocked it off in this direction belt is traveling away from me. Grip on the belt is uh, 240. I've also got the Teflon tape on this. Okay. And when you sharpen, you're going to see a burr come up on that edge. I've sharpened this side. And that's what you look for. You want to make sure that burr comes up on the edge. And you can see it if you got light on there. I'm going to hit this other side again just so you can see it come up again on this side. Okay? So, once you knock that burr off on a buff strap, the plate will be, you know, just about razor blade sharp. Again, this is traveling away from me. It's a, it's a stiff buff. The buff has been treated with a um, some type of compound to make it stiff. I use basically the same compound as I use for buffing. You see that furrow come right off. I generally make two passes on each side, one first, two on the other, and 
then I go back and hit this side. And generally that should make it uh, sharp enough to shave with. Now we're going to put the buff wheel on and we're going to buff and this knife will be all repaired. One thing is when you're buffing, you want to keep the edges of your wheel pretty much clean of buffing compound. You put your compound in the center. So you're doing your work in your center and you pull off to the edge. Any residue that's on there will be pulled off by the cleaner part. So I'm just going to rake off the edges of this a little bit.